the constitutional settlements of 27 and 23 BC. So this is going to be a slightly technical topic. It needs to be, uh, but we can try and pin it to big historical questions like how did Roman emperors rule the empire? And what did it mean to be the princeps, the Roman emperor? What did titles like consul or imperator or tribune of the plebs or father of the fatherland, all these titles that emperors accumulated, what do they actually mean? How do they function? Why do they need them? What precise constitutional powers did Augustus have through which he ruled the empire? And that can open up some interesting questions for us, like, did Augustus restore the Republic? Did he claim to restore the Republic? Uh, spoiler alert, no, he didn't really, but he did talk about it. But what does that mean? Right? What does that question mean? And why is it even raised in the sources, in the discourse, in the, in the questions about the period? Let's have a think about that. If we get very concerned about titles, constitutional powers, legal instruments, is that the same kind of concern that either our literary sources had, that they talked about? Is it the kind of thing that Augustus worried about? And who is his audience? What kind of game is he trying to play? Why does this stuff matter? How much does it matter? So we're looking a bit at the question of reality versus appearance. And this is something that our Roman sources, I think especially Tacitus, love to think about. The idea of a facade, uh, a vultus, a kind of outward appearance of things. And behind it may be a different kind of reality bubbling away and the hypocrisy in the gulf between the two. It's very tussity in the theme. But it, it comes from, it's rooted in the kinds of games that Augustus played, putting on a, a, a facade of constitutional propriety, of continuity, of conservatism, of maintaining old offices like the, the consul, maintaining the role and dignity and prestige of the Senate, at the same time actually as grafting effectively an autarky, a monarchy, onto the Roman state in which he would have sole rule and his heirs, his appointed heirs, his adoptive children in the end, would go on to hold the supreme office after his own death. It's clearly kind of a monarchy, but it's talking the language of republicanism. How does that work? So, let's think a bit about the timeline. Julius Caesar is assassinated in 44 BC. The Roman world divides into factions. Octavian, the future Augustus, Antony and Lepidus form a triumvirate. We've already seen that breaks down through the 30s. They, they pursue the assassins of Caesar. They win victories the Battle of Philippi and so on. But that compact starts to break up. Um, by the late 30s, it's moribund, and Octavian defeats Antony at the Battle of Actium, assumes sole mastery of the Roman world. So the 30s BC, taken up with that long unspooling of different alliances and marriages and campaigns against Sextus Pompey, and we get to 29 BC, Augustus's triumph, uh, sorry, Octavian's triumph, and let's say that by that date he has eliminated all his rivals, he is in sole command, he's the last man standing, his grip on power seems to be absolute, but he now has to transmit that into a system that's actually stable and has longevity. You know, he's got there by the momentum of fighting in a civil war. He's done very well, he's defeated the people who won't be subject to him, and the others he's you know, welcomed their, their allegiance, and he is now in charge, in sole charge. But that's a very fragile situation, that's, that's a result of very destabilizing, very damaging period of conflict. How do you turn that into a stable system of government that can actually run the Roman world and gives Octavian Augustus a fair chance of surviving and creating something he can pass on intact to a chosen heir? Well, he does manage to do it. He's in power for an enormously long time, 31 BC to AD 40, now 45 years, so long that he wears out a whole succession of different possible heirs and successors. We'll get to that. Um, but he does manage to do it. How does he manage to do it? One of the ways in which he, do, he does it is by a series of constitutional settlements where he tries to work out the position that he occupies vis-a-vis -vis the remains of the Roman state. Now we talk about the Republic and the Latin phrase is res publica and that doesn't quite mean the old Republican constitution. The res publica means something like the state, the commonwealth, the, the well-being of the people. When we say Republic, we tend to mean the rule by annually elected magistrates like consuls and a senate, a republican form of government that's replaced by the imperial form of government. So there's already a slight tension or discrepancy in the language. Augustus certainly talks about res publica restituta, the republic being restored, but he sort of means helping the battered old lady up to her feet again, setting things in order, dusting off you know, the debris of civil war, getting the commonwealth up and running doesn't quite mean restoring precisely the legal forms and constitutional forms that preceded uh, the world of Caesar and Augustus. But the ambiguity is useful to him, um, so we'll bear that in mind.
So what does he do? He is master of the Roman world. Uh, in 27 BC, a couple of years in after his triumph, he sits down and works out um, a settlement that he hopes will establish the way his power actually functions and will allow other people like the Senate to relate to him and understand what he's about. He'll be able to bring in other officers to help him administer and run the empire without creating dangerous rivals, without giving other people too much of a power base. That's his aim. Um, he can start thinking about his succession. So these are his aims. What does he do? Um, he seems to be ruling through a kind of universal consent at this date. He's got to transmit it and transform it to some kind of actual legal constitutional basis. So he takes a decision to clarify his position at this date. Um, what does he do? He calls a meeting of the Senate and he says to them, I'm laying down my powers um, and this is the episode that he takes as, as his restoration of the Republic, if we, if we want to believe in that. Uh, I'm laying down my powers and I'm going to pick up a new set that you're going to grant to me. Um, what is that going to look like? It contains a, a number of elements. Firstly, Augustus is given the governorship of an enormous super province. So you'll know that the Roman Empire is divided up into a series of provinces. Those provinces traditionally are ruled by governors who are senators. They go out from Rome. They have a period of time in the province where they administer justice and they quite often engage in spectacular corruption to line their own pockets and they come back to Rome for the rest of their political career. So these provinces need to be governed. They need an apparatus of Roman government. It's always quite a small apparatus. But they're also where the legions are, where the army is, and that, of course, is a huge power base. We've just seen in the preceding decades how generals of Roman legions can use those legions and the loyalty of their troops to propel themselves to um, destructive heights of power. We saw that with Caesar, with Pompey, with Octavian, with Mark Antony. So he has to do something to get control of the troops as well. So what he does is to have granted to him this, this mega province that contains Spain and Gaul and Egypt and all the militarised provinces, um, Syria, Cyprus, and he gets that province for 10 years. It contains all but three of the Roman legions, so at a stroke he gets complete control of all the provinces with heavy bodies of troops in. Um, there are still uh, legates in those provinces, governors chosen by the emperor, but they are his people, his creations, his promotions. So he is the supreme authority in that province, and his authority always outranks theirs. So he gets a massive province, he gets control of the legions, and this is his, his motive. Dio tells us um, that Augustus says, I am taking on the hardships and the dangers and the difficult provinces where we still need troops because you know, they're not quite settled yet. But in reality, that again is a little piece of window dressing or hypocrisy. He's actually giving himself the provinces with the troops because he wants a tight, tight grip on that army. So, item one, a big province. Item two, he gets to remain consul. You know that consul is the chief magistrate in the Roman state. There's normally two of them, and they're normally in office for a year. Augustus now, um, we're going to call him Augustus because in 27 he finally gets that name. Augustus is going to remain as consul, and in fact he holds the consulship again and again and again, which is not really constitutionally proper. He has a, a partner in the consulship, but he, he takes the supreme authority. So if you challenged him, he would say, I'm not a king, I'm not a demagogue, I'm not a dictator, I'm simply holding the age-old, 500 years old, chief magistrate of the Roman state. What could be more unimpeachably, constitutionally respectable than that? But the fact that he holds it again and again and again, and he's holding it so that his imperium, his technical magisterial authority, outranks everybody else's, well, you can see he's bending the constitution almost as far as he can without it breaking. He gets called Augustus at this date by the Senate, right? He drops his, um, his family names or adds to them the name Augustus, which means sort of sacred, holy, it's quite difficult to pass. August, actually, um, the English word August obviously comes from it. Numinous, uh, kind of hedged round by a halo of divinity. Um, quite a carefully considered name. We're told he considered other names, but Augustus is the one that he liked. And this opens the floodgates to a whole slew of honours that are now poured upon him um, nominally by the Senate, in gratitude for his having you know, laid down his, his powers and taken up this supposedly constitutional mix of pre-existing powers, the Senate says, thank goodness for such a modest, respectful leader, we're going to give you uh, the Corona Civica, um, the oak wreath crown that you wear for saving the lives of citizens. Um, uh, we're going to give you um, a, uh, a special shield in the Senate House that's going to have your virtues on it, your clementia, 
um, and your pietas, your, your kind of the great virtues that you embody, O Augustus, we're going to engrave onto a shield and put up in the Senate House to remind the whole Senate every time we ever have a meeting who's really in charge and, and why he's in charge, because he's such a virtuous individual. So what we're seeing in this constitutional settlement is not just the nuts and bolts and technicalities of power, but actually how it's presented, the imagery of it. And what we want to read here is res gestae, uh, paragraph 34. The res gestae, we'll talk about later, the long inscription that Augustus left of his own career. Brilliant source for us, albeit one that very much presents his side of the story. Paragraph 34 of the res gestae, worth reading in lactal. In my sixth and seventh consulships, that is 28, 27 BC, after I had extinguished the civil wars, at a time when, with universal consent, I was in complete control of affairs, I transferred the Republic from my power to the dominion of the Senate and people of Rome. So he's saying, I've won all the wars, everybody's agreed that I am the sole victor, and yet I've laid down my powers, I've given them to the Senate and the people. So if we talk about the restoration of the Republic, this is the moment. For this service, I was named Augustus by decree of the Senate. And the doorposts of my house were publicly wreathed with bay leaves, and a civic crown was fixed over my door, and a golden shield was set up in the Curia Julia, the Senate House, as attested by the inscription thereon, it was given to me by the Senate and the people of Rome on account of my courage, my clemency, my justice, my piety. The four virtues that Augustus settles on as the hallmarks of his reign, the kind of flavour of his reign, justice tempered with mercy, piety and courage. After this time, I excelled everybody in auctoritas, which means personal influence, but I possessed no more official power, potestas, than the others who were my colleagues in the magistracies. And this paragraph, make no apology for reading it in full, because it's absolutely vital, gives us a lot of detail about what Augustus thinks he's doing here. One, he's won the civil wars and he's in total control. Two, he makes a show of giving that power back to the Senate and people. Three, in return, he is showered with these honours, the titles, the shields, the oak wreaths, the endless adulation. Four, this huge outpouring of honours augments his auctoritas, his personal authority, to a level where nobody can even get close to him. You know, he's the nearest thing to a god on earth. But his potestas, his actual constitutional legal power, is never any more than anybody else's. Well, we've kind of seen he, he hoovers up the best provinces and he takes a consulship again and again, so that's not quite the whole truth. But it is true that he rules through this strange amalgamation of existing offices and titles and powers. But what he really rules through, he says, is his personal charisma, his auctoritas, his track record, his link to the gods, his brilliant personal virtues. So this is the way he presents it. He's not actually that interested in telling us the nuts and bolts of the legal technicalities. He's much more about, uh, more about the image, the charisma, the, the personal uh, authority. Um, but, but he needs a system because when he dies, his actoritas kind of dies with him. You know, it flows in the veins of his, of his family. But um, if your whole system is predicated on the personal Actoritas of one man, that's got a shelf life on it. So he's also trying to create a system that will survive his death and can be transmitted, I think, at this date. Um, so title, honours, all very important to him. Uh, and it's worth dwelling on those terms. Remember, potestas is official power, actoritas is personal esteem, personal standing. So that's what Augustus was trying to achieve. That's at least the way he would have presented it. How is it seen? How is it reacted to? Well, a little bit later, we'll look at some of the official emanations of this in the res gestae, the inscription, in the coin imagery. And we'll look at some contemporary reaction among the poets, and we'll talk about how reliable, how useful that is. We can also think about how Roman historians, looking back, saw this. For example, Tacitus, great consular historian, who was writing 100 and some years after Augustus, after a turbulent century that had had emperors like Caligula and Nero and Domitian, who had shown how tyrannical this system could be, but also some good emperors who you know, achieved great things for the Roman people and the state and had made positive contributions. And in the case of Trajan, for example, Tacitus's own colleague and, and uh, commander as emperor, were trying to find an accommodation with the Senate. So Tacitus has seen good and bad emperors. Looking back at Augustus, the foundation of the imperial system, he doesn't dwell very much on the technical details of what sorts of magistracy or what kind of province Augustus held. Those details slip into his writing, but he doesn't really dwell on them. He writes a famous passage at the beginning of his great historical work, The Annals, which tells us about the rise of Augustus, and we'll, we'll come back to this and read it in full a bit later. 
It's in Lactor at section F. The whole of section F in that Lactor volume is this great slab of Tacitus, which is quite correct because the opening of the annals gives you such a great kind of overview of the rise and early career of, of Augustus. Um, the, the annals really start in AD 14 with the death of Augustus, but Tacitus gives you this retrospective view of what the reign had achieved. And the passage that we, we get um, suggests that Augustus was, was gradually accreting auctoritas, this kind of personal charisma. He was gradually winning over different groups quite systematically and deliberately, the army, the senate, the provincials, the common people. And he was doing that in different ways. We'll look at how a bit later. And that in doing this, he was delighting everybody with the, the benefits of peace. Um, there was no opposition because the bravest souls had died in battle or fallen victim to prescriptions. And the surviving aristocracy um, enjoyed wealth and status under Augustus that made them servile. They saw no reason really to rebel against him. And the provinces had no cause to rebel either. So Augustus is um, gradually accreting to himself powers, uh, but also presenting those powers um, as a consul. He says he presents himself as a consul content to defend the people by virtue of the tribunician power. So there's a little snippet there about the offices that Augustus holds, but rather more on the way in which he bent various factions within the Roman state to agree with him and to, to fall in behind his will. So imagery is really important here, and um, symbolism and honours and titles seem to be at least as important to Augustus as the actual mechanism of constitutional control, or at least more interesting to talk about. And Augustus is very keen to remind us that he held no more official power than his colleagues in the various Republican magistracies, which all continued to operate. They needed to, to run bits of the Roman world, um, albeit now the candidates filling those were all approved by Augustus himself. And he maintains a very close control of political affairs and of the army. So he makes this ostentatious play in 27 of laying down um, whatever residual powers he had from his triumvirate, at least going to the Senate and saying, I rule only by your consent, by putting together a package that he thought had a bit more legitimacy or longevity to it, but I think above all by ensuring that he was showered with honours which boosted up his personal nectoritas and made him pretty much unchallengeable as supreme in the state. Um, and the speech to the Senate that Augustus makes, which is reported in Cassius' Dio, book 53, makes his approach plain. Every factitious element, that is every possible rival element in the state, has either been put down by the application of justice or brought to its senses by receiving mercy, that virtue again of clemency, which is on the shield. Those who are on my side have been made devoted by my reciprocating their friendly services and bound fast by having a share in the government. So Augustus is saying, come with me and I will make you partners in the ruling of the state. I will still have a place for the Senate. I will still find you useful work to do. But if you oppose me, then you'll face my wrath, or perhaps even worse, you'll face my mercy, and then you'll be totally under my uh, spell because you're only, you know, if, if, if I show you mercy, if you rebel against me, everybody will know that uh, I could have snuffed you out, but instead I chose to keep you on. So he uses clemency and the attractions of peace and the promise of wealth and power to bring the Senate along with him. Quite a careful, well-calibrated, delicate balancing act. 